Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Gig Harbor City Council meeting of Monday, November 14th, 2022. And the time is 5.34 p.m. And I will do a call or a roll call from my far left. Council Member Wook. Here. Council Member Storset. Here. Council Member Rodenberg is excused this evening. Council Member Likens. Here. Council Member Henderson. Here. Council Member Denson. Here. And Council Member Barber. Here. Okay, great. Thank you all. And now I would like to invite up to the podium Girl Scout Troop number 46676 to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would all stand with us. And you girls go start when you're ready. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job. And do you, do you guys want to come up here for a picture with the council? Do you want to come stand right up in front here and we'll all squeeze in for a picture, okay? There you go. Okay. So tell us when to say, we'll just say cheese. <laughs> Look at your cheese. Okay, we good? Thank you. Thank you girls so much. Thank you. I, right? I don't know that anything tops that cuteness. So, okay. Thank you girls so much. Bye. Have a good night. Thanks, parents. <laughs> so before we begin this council meeting, we would like to recognize that we are gathered on not only the ancestral and traditional lands of the Sklobopsh Band of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, but also on the site of one of the largest and longest standing historic villages of the people, the original inhabitants of the Gig Harbor area. Um, under changes to the agenda, first I will ask council if there are any changes. Okay, um, we do have one change. We are going to move the last item, number nine, up to new business one. So I'll give you a minute to shift that. And that way we can hear from our new parks manager, Jennifer Haro. Um, and also, but uh, we'll start with um, public works director, Jeff Langhelm. Oh, hold on one second before I do that. I got all out of order, just a minute. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you, council. Okay, so, and we now have a presentation. And again, I'm sorry, we, I got all discombobulated, so I apologize, everybody. We have a presentation from South Sound Mobile Pump Out Program, and this is, um, I'd like to welcome Pierce County Watershed Planner, Jeff Barney and Paul Wayne. Thanks for being here. Um, Paul Wayne is the owner of Northwest Mobile Pump Out and Environmental Services, or are you both? Are you co-owners or? Uh, no, Jeff is with the county and I have a private business, but I'm the operator. Okay. Great. Well, come welcome forward to the podium. And um, I'm sorry, you'll have to move the mic back, back up. To, or you, just, you know, you can keep it down there if you want. to. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Council. My name is Jeff Barney. I'm a watershed planner with Pierce County Service Water Manager. And just wanted to give you guys a quick overview of a program uh, that your city's a partnership in, uh, along with Paul and a program called the Clean Vessel Act Funding that we operate that is not only here, but in all of South Puget Sound. Uh, so quickly, uh, before we even get into our presentation, I have a quick video we wanna play. Um, it's about a four minute video, then we have just eight slides to go through to give you an overview of the program and what your uh, participation brings. Great. <clears throat> Today, we're going out on the waters to help Pierce County voters with one of their most basic needs. Paul, good to meet you. I got to tell you, I'm excited to be at the Long Branch Marina today. Can you tell me what we're going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to pump out people's boats. So a lot of these boats have marine toilets that go into a holding tank, and we're going to take that content out. Yes, that's correct. So what are the environmental benefits to 
having a pump out boat. It just makes it so much easier to keep the water clean. It would be very challenging for the county to try to put in pump out stations at all of the destination locations around the Puget Sound. It would be very expensive, very difficult to maintain. Whereas I can go hit them all in a few hours. Good for fish, good for shellfish, good for boaters, and good for people who recreate on the water. That's exactly right. Want to hop on board and give me a hand? Absolutely. Let's go. All right. Slow it down. I'll put the flag up. You guys need a pump out? All right. Very good. I'll be right there. So the first thing you do is you press it just slightly. You get a little bit of suction and then you open it fully. My pump pumps at a rate of 25 gallons a minute. And you just always pump dry. <coughs> up till there's nothing left. We really appreciate this boat. We so do. It's, it's the key to making Puget Sound clean. I think his boat is empty. I think that's a good Well, I think it's wonderful to see. Now we can go on boat and not worry about being overfished. <laughs> I'm going to fly up to the boat. There you go. It's very green. Do you see a variation of color? <laughs> you do, actually. <laughs> Is that because they're putting treatment in there? Yeah. So he's empty. There you go. All clean. So we just pumped this meridian over here, but now the bay liner down here has got to get pumped. So we're going to have to haul the hose out the whole way to pump that guy as well. Is that all you need, Paul? I think that'll do it. Okay, so this one's kind of a tricky one. There you go. That was perfect, Mike. Right? You didn't spill a drop. You got to coil all this back in. So far, we've pumped three boats. That's about 150 gallons of black water that's not going into Puget Sound. Are we ready to go? I'm ready. So we're going to Penrose? We're going to go by and see if they want one. Do you need a pump out? We're out at Penrose State Park, checking with folks who are anchored here to see if they need the service. You guys need a pump out? A lot of them are happy to hear about it, said they don't need it today, but would like Paul to come back on Sunday. And he's going to be here. You guys have a great time. Yeah, this guy had a full tank. Yeah, I'm here to work. We're going to do, uh, yeah, the Katie Krogan. <laughs> We used to build our itinerary around where we were going to be able to pump out. Being able to schedule it here and leave with empty tanks is a big, big plus. Down south, we've never really had any facilities that could provide us with pump out. To be economically efficient and environmentally efficient at the same time is great. Love the service. Good job, Bruce. You're a dab and at this. <laughs> The subject matter is something you try not to think about, but when you have to think about it, then it's good to know that Pierce County provides a service. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Paul, thank you very much for letting me spend the day with you. Well, thank you, Bruce. It's been an honor. And thanks to our Planning and Public Works Department for the great work they're doing in keeping the waters of Pierce County clean and delivering great service. And we'll see you next time on Inside Pierce County. That's great. So uh, thank you for watching that short video. That gives you a, a programmatic overview of what we do for here, where the boat is based into all South Puget Sound. But we have a few slides to show. And at this point, Paul is our operator. So he's a subrecipient contractor of the grant that we oversee in partnership with Big Harbor, City of Big Harbor, in partnership of Mentorbrook Oysters and Recreational Boating Association of Washington. So we're a collaborative group. Paul has a slide that we'll talk about that. But uh, this came about with needs from recreational boaters to shellfish industries to the county and its own water quality along with the city and its water quality and i'll let paul take it away from here all right well, thank you very much pleasure to meet you all um so the first slide uh jeff has basically covered that it talks about the grant essentially um the picture there is of me in gig harbor um uh, again you know we keep this boat in gig harbor i i um I operate the program on Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays. And I, you know, as I start out, I'll I'll do Gig Harbor and then I'll go do the program in the South Sound. And when I come back, I'll do Gig Harbor again. 
and uh, I do that three times a week. So, you know, Gig Harbor actually gets quite a lot of coverage. Um, but let's move on to the next uh, slide. Okay, so this, uh, this is a map of the total area I cover. Um, initially, we started just in the South Sound areas, uh, which is in the, uh, you know, the, the reddish color there. So uh, it would include Oro Bay, Falusi, um, Penrose, Fox Island, um, Wallachip Bay, um, and also Gig Harbor. Um, we also include in that all the Yacht Club outstations because uh, there are several in the South Sound and they don't have pump out facilities. Um, the program is focused toward recreational boaters only. So it's those guys that are out in their boat, they've come from Seattle or they've come from Tacoma or somewhere like that. And, and um, um, you know, they're either at anchor or they're at Yacht Club Bank Station or they're at a public dock. Um, so it's a good service for them to provide that because otherwise it's very difficult for them to pump out, particularly in the South Sound, because there are very few uh, actual working pump out stations um, for them. So th this service, um, you know, it, it just uh, is a great service to voters because otherwise it'd be very difficult for them. But um, so in 2021, uh, those are the red areas and then the green areas, we, we expanded the program um, to include state parks, um, also Olympia Yacht Club Out Station uh, as well. So um, I basically doubled our area. And when I do that whole route in a day, it's about a hundred miles. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, usually Saturdays and Sundays, I'll just do the red area and then Monday I'll do all of the areas, but uh, you know, occasionally I'll change that up, change that around. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, this year, 2022, I decided to, you know, give us a goal for the season. We we initially thought that you know it'd be really good if we could get 10,000 gallons, if we could pump out 10,000 gallons of waste. We ended up at 12,000 gallons, we really exceeded our goal. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we actually uh, did about 120% of the goal. So pretty thrilled with that. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is gallons pumped. Blue is 2021 and red is uh, 2022. As you can see, some nice progress there. When we started in 2021, we started late in the year. There was no announcements. There was no, you know, big fanfare of us starting this. We just started doing it. Um, 2022, people now know about us. So um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, now these are gallons by location. Um, <clears throat> the big spike there, that's Gay Carver. You guys did great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, this is just recreational boaters. I service the marinas of gig harbors with my private business. Um, and you'd think that those guys that pay for the pump out, they'd want to, you know, they'd try to abuse the free pump out service, but they don't. Um, all of those pump outs there, that's all recreational boaters. People at marinas, they're more than happy to pay for the service. And they can come by that convenience and come mm -hmm. to their marina. They're very happy to pay for that. Um, but you can see all the different locations I go to. There's a lot there. Um, but but by far, um, Gig Harbor is the hot spot of South Sound. It's where everybody comes. Mm -hmm. So you really need this pump out service. You know, I know, I know you've got uh, pump out stations at the Maritime Pier and, you, and you've got one at Jerry Scott, uh, but it's difficult for boaters because, you know, if they have a, a space at the dock there to park their boat, they don't want to move their boat to go pump out because if they do that, they can lose the spot. You know, and it's the same thing with boats at anchor. Um, 
you know, it's a huge inconvenience. It's just so much better to have a guy that comes along and does it for you. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so <clears throat> both in 2021 and 2022, it's been extremely successful. Um, gosh, just, you know, I have thousands of customers and the feedback is just 100% positive. There's not one person that doesn't appreciate what we do. Um, yeah, so lots of happy customers. Uh, next slide. All right, well, uh, uh, this slide, uh, Jeff will probably talk more to it, but um, this covers our uh, partners. And we have uh, many partners, including Pierce County, Minderbrook, Alliance for a Healthy South Sound, and Geek Harbor. So um, I think that was the last slide. So uh, any questions? Any questions from council? Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, excellent. Thank you very much for doing this service. It's great. Um, <clears throat> I'm on the Whisper Committee, the West Sound Partners for Environmental Restoration. Uh, one of our earlier meetings this year, they were talking a lot about derelict boats and people living on them. And I know you're you're focused on the recreational element. Can you maybe, uh, Jeff, speak to is the county going to be doing something for those folks living on derelict because that's so yes i just had a meeting uh with kirby last week as a matter of fact um with kitsap county uh talking about our program so a few things um you know the, the funding that's paid for in the boating program that we do has very explicit do's and do nots of the vessels um so that is servicing recreational boaters not commercial boaters that said and done paul is still eyes and ears on the water um, so derelict vessels, he still reports to me. I report to DNR to make sure they're on the list and being tracked. Um, Paul has come across vessels this past summer that were stolen from here in the harbor. Um, he takes Latin longs, reports those. So my sales pitch in trying to get partnerships outside of Pierce County, you know, we're, we're already covering Mason and Thurston County. would love to bring Kitsap on board. Um, and King County has a different issue with the lake itself as one of their main water quality issues. But Paul's ability or any operator that does this still is on a vessel more times than not than our Marine service or our fires are out patrolling and in different frequencies and has literally acted as the eyes and ears. And then I can use that through the network that I do. So we, uh, you know, went through Commissioner Garado and had a meeting last week with another staff member who I've not met, but then uh, Kirby and gave a presentation of what we do, our program. Um, and would encourage them to join because of the shared watershed boundaries and the work that we do in Kitsap County, the Pierce County, it's advantageous. Um, also Paul's model, why Pierce County went with him is he has an established business here in Gig Harbor. He keeps boats in Kitsap County as well. Um, so that was security in us looking at a long-term partnership and then putting the investment from our council's funding to my staff time to an established business owner and operator. And I think that helped um, as Kitsap said, there's a lot to digest on this, but several of the boats that we lost from Lake Bay Marina um, when the docks were taken away have now made their way to Sinclair Inlet. Um, so they've just displaced and they're still to the boards and or abandoned or derelict or whatever establishment of people that otherwise cannot afford to be in a marina. So there, there's an advantageous uh, point during that season that he operates out there um, that provides information to us. Um, one thing I want to add is, you know, the little boards at marinas, they, they all use them. Um, there are some little boards out in the South Sound uh, on anchor that will use me. And, I, you know, I'll stop by, I'll pump them in, and rather they, they pump out than, than not. Um, but as far as your, you know, your little boards in Gate Harbor, there are very, very few that don't. That don't hire me to come from Great. Council Member Denson. Yes, I just wanted to thank Paul and Jeff for being such huge advocates of this program. And I understand that it's you know pretty unusual countrywide that we have this program. And I'm really, really proud of the city of Geek Harbor 
for stepping up to be a model for other communities to support this. Um, and we've seen the data. It obviously, I think, is a very good investment. It's great for our environment. It's great for recreation, for people who are sailing or swimming or boating. We want clean waters. And I think it's also really good for economic development here in Gig Harbor. People know that they can come in, they can get pumped out, and hopefully they will, you know, visit our town and and enjoy some of you know what we offer along our waterfront. So thank you guys for being awesome partners. And we, I certainly hope to continue supporting this. Thank you. Last I'll add to that uh, is we recently shot a video. The federal partners uh, had seen this video. So the Federal Fish and Wildlife and uh, Commissioner Denson was one of the people interviewed along with the other partners. And that video, I got a sneak peek on Friday of a minute and a half clip and they're doing their final clip that should be out that I'll be happy to share uh, through Jeff. Um, and, and all of you, and it, it more, the illustration of that video was to get other municipalities, be it a port, a city, a county, and to be like, okay, Pierce County did it, it's not terribly difficult. They built this partnership, true working partnership. Um, and so that's the promotional edge that they're trying to put the finishing touches on, but be happy to share that. And uh, it was shot here at the Maritime Pier. And, uh, and you know, we brought, good awareness to the issues that we have here in the harbor in South Puget Sound and Puget Sound wide. So thank you. Great, looking forward to seeing that. Council member Storset. Actually, my light's not Oh, working. is your light broken again? Still, oh, bummer. Okay, so raise your hand, I guess, the rest of the evening. Thank <laughs> and I'll you. Try. Thank okay, you. Council member Wick. Jeff and Paul, thank you so much for keeping our waters healthy, helping to do that. My question is uh, in the summertime, we have a lot of boaters who visit Gig Harbor. How do you get the word out? Um, well, gosh, it's uh, it's very organic actually. Um, but we do do some publication, but it's very organic. I mean, people people talk. Um, so boaters ask, will ask when there's an eight foot out. flag on the top of the boat that says "free pump out." Okay, that helps. Um, <laughs> we have had it out in publications. Um, Paul's business is getting rather notarized. So those around here that know him and then see the boats, the boats, if you're in the Harbor, it's, you know, 28 foot long overall and, and has a large red flag that says free mobile pump out. Okay. Um, they can hail them on VHF. They go to the website that we have at Pierce County that can then route to his telephone. He can do it. They can do online bookings, to the website, or they can do a phone call and book through that. And it helps on the large scale weekends. Definitely whether he's here in the Harbor has to run to Oro Bay that those that can book ahead of time helps him schedule his day. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah you're thanks. welcome. Council members, oh, Storset, did you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're gone. Okay. <laughs> so your light was for Jenny. Okay, got it. Got it. Oh, well, well, thank you again so much for being here and for what you do. And um, I'll maybe I'll touch base with you about maybe putting this in our Gigabyte newsletter for some it. extra coverage. And um, yeah, really appreciate what you do. Happy to be a partner. Thank, Thank you very you much. So Thanks much. for having us. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to the mayor's report. Um, this was in the Gigabyte last week, but I just wanted to say again, we closed on our um, third and final phase of the, it's actually phase two, but it was the third to close of our land purchase in downtown Gig Harbor. So we now have over 40 acres that will be preserved forever in the heart of our downtown and not developed. So we are very excited about that. Um, we have an open house, an informational open house uh, for our sports complex, phase 1B on Wednesday, this Wednesday, right out there in the lobby at five o'clock. So come and hear from staff about the, the project and the pro, um, process and where we are. Um, we also have our tree lighting ceremony coming up on December 3rd with lots of surprises. So you need to check it out. Make sure you mark your calendars for December 3rd. And I think it's, does it start at five, six, five, five o'clock. So we'll more to come. We'll have Facebook posts and it'll be in the gigabyte again. So you'll, you'll keep seeing it, but just wanted to put a plug in for that tree lighting because it's going to be different than it has been in past years. That's all I'll tell you. So, all right. So that's it for my report and I'll move on to our city administrator, Katrina Knudsen for her report. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, council. A uh, quick shout out to our IT manager, Keith Smith for uh, promptly fixing our microphones after we couldn't hear each other. 
uh, yes. at our last council meeting, as well as with the improvements that have been done to the camera. Uh, we know that that was a little bit bumpy, but we're great to grateful to be in a, able to offer a hybrid opportunity for our citizens to participate in our meetings. Um, we know that Veterans Day was last week and in front of council and the, the citizens today, we just want to say again, uh, acknowledge the veterans that uh, not only live in our community, but uh, work for the city of Gig Harbor. And um, as you may or may not be able to see on the screen up here, we have quite a few um, and some that are in the audience with us today, Carl DeSemus, uh, Dave Rodenbach and Kelly Busey uh, all served our country in the military. And we thank them and all the other city staff for their service. I will note we are represented up there with all of the branches of service, except for the Space Force. So we have a little <laughs> bit uh, of an opportunity in future staff uh, in, uh, staff recruitments. But just thank you um, everyone, all the veterans for their service and their sacrifices of their families as well. Uh, second thing is Jennifer Harrow. Haro, Haro is here. She's our new parks manager. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> and we are delighted she started last week and has hit the ground running with a number of meetings and um, is coming along very well within the department. Jennifer has 29 years of experience in local government, um, most recently in the Kitsap County Commissioner's Office as a policy analyst, but has uh, environmental experience as well as land use and planning. So we believe she'll be an excellent fit here and be able to guide us in our many park endeavors. And then lastly, Carl DeSemus has um, accepted a promotion to community development director from principal planner. Uh, and that is effective today. So he is now in that role. And with that, we will be hiring for a principal planner to fill his shoes. And we'll be posting that internally for a period of five days first, hopefully to get some internal candidates. And if not, that'll be posted on our website. Um, and that concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. We're so happy to have Jennifer in her role and now Carl in this new role. Um, lots of good things happening. Um, I will now open up the public comment period for non-agenda items. Um, Josh, were there any written comments received for non-agenda items? There are no written comments this evening. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on an item not on the agenda? Okay. Um, our online audience, I can't see you, but thank you for joining us this evening. Um, are there any hands raised, Josh, for public comment? You, um, you can push star nine on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. I have no raised hands for comment. Okay. All right, we will close the public comment on non-agenda items and then move to item one, which as a reminder was item number nine. So this is our professional services contract with HBB Landscape Architects for the Crescent Creek Park Master Plan. And um, this report comes to us from our public works director, Jeff Flinghelm. Thank you, Mayor, good evening council. <clears throat> The proposed contract that you have before you tonight from HVB Landscape Architects would provide for the development of a park master plan for the city's Crescent Creek Park. Um, as noted in the agenda, agenda bill, this master plan has been a long time coming. Uh, proposed scope that's included with the contract describes in detail the major elements of the master planning process. Uh, each item in that scope has a separate task. You'll see that there are, uh, I believe, six primary tasks and nine optional tasks. Uh, in general, this work would evaluate the conditions uh, that exist in the park today. And with input from stakeholders, the public, uh, the Parks Commission and City Council, we will be developing a master plan that would provide for the opportunity to make uh, many different elements of this park that are currently underutilized and make them more functional for residents. Uh, the contract and the scope of work does focus on uh, what to do with the existing Masonic Lodge building. That's a part of it. 
and also identifies opportunities to make the park more ADA accessible. The agenda bill also describes that the proposed primary tasks and three optional tasks have been recommended by staff to include with the total contract. Um, however, after further consideration uh, with talking to potential stakeholders and staff, uh, right now staff is also recommending adding task 11 to the proposed contract work. Uh, specifically, this task 11 uh, would provide structural analysis for the Masonic Lodge. Um, we have looked at the Masonic Lodge and uh, if we think that in order to make an informed decision about whether or not to move forward with trying to keep the Masonic Lodge, we should know what degree of structural improvements are required for the project itself. So um, what I'm asking for tonight actually is slightly modification to the agenda bill. It's adding task 11 to the scope. This adds just under $7,000 uh, pre-tax but would bring the total uh, new amount for the contract to $155,660.54. So uh, that's my report. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great, thank you, Jeff. Any clarifying questions from council? Councilmember Wook? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so item, so the task 11 that we see here with the lines drawn through it, uh, those lines are to be removed and, and the task stays. Correct. If approved as recommended by staff now that it would remove the strikeouts for task 11 and include that in the contract. Thank you. Councilmember Barber. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Director Langham, I noticed that there's not mention of the play structure at Crescent Creek in this proposal. And I'm thinking back to discussions that it seems like we had on the Parks Commission about the parks play structure, sorry. And I'm wondering if you could address why that's not mentioned in here, if there's any plans still to improve it, make it ADA, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Uh, the approach that was taken back in March of 2020, which is when this uh, contract was first initiated, uh, was to look at the underutilized areas of the park uh, with the brand new play structure that was installed, well, brand new, the new, newer play structure that was installed uh, a few years ago and the um, existing uh, covered picnic area and the restrooms. The intent was just to kind of leave that as it is and to focus more on the areas that are, are either, like I said, underutilized or not utilized at all. There are a series of parcels that we own in and around the park that uh, are not currently being used mm -hmm. for park purposes. And so the intent is to look at areas beyond those that are right up against the creek and leave the areas against the creek as is for now. Okay, that makes sense. Is that place structure? I don't recall how um, ADA compliant that structure is. It is ADA compliant. Okay, yeah, perfect. When it was constructed, that was actually one of the big uh, intents to make that structure ADA compliant when it wasn't previously. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Director Langholm. I um, had a question about uh, renderings. The final output of this will be a master plan that we're going to, it's going to be um, presented to the council and the and the community as well. Uh, is it just going to be tables and graphs, or it's? I, I was doing a little word search through here, and mo most of the renderings seem to be struck and struck struck out. But just <laughs> I, hopefully, there's. I mean, I I think it's easier to get uh, images and plans across when we've got renderings of what's being looked at and what's going to be proposed. So I just want to make sure that there's enough of that in there. Um, yes, the, each time that we have uh, meetings with stakeholders, meeting with uh, the public and council and parks commission, there's going to be uh, drawings that are created. I'm, I don't know if we could make, we didn't call out 3D renderings, but we'll definitely have um, 2D site plans and some colored renderings that are uh, definitely something that the public would be easy to assimilate. I mean, it's not going to be construction drawings. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Okay, great. I don't see any other lights. So I will open up the public comment on this agenda item. Um, first, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on this item? Okay, um, our online audience, uh, again, you can push star nine on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Any raised hands? Uh, no, no commenters online and no written comments for this item. Oh, thank you, yes. Okay, all right, we'll close the public comment on this agenda item and I'll open it up for council deliberation and action. And your light is still on. No, you're good. Council member Barber. I am, um, as Director Langham knows, really excited to see this project coming to us tonight. It's been a long time coming and we all know that. So I would like to approve and authorize the mayor to execute a professional services contract for the Crescent Creek Park master planning with Hogue, Beck and Baird in an amount not to exceed 148.095.38 plus task 11. And I don't remember the new total. So I'm hoping that will work as a motion. I think that'll work. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second, second it. Okay. That was a tie, I think, between Henderson and Likens. <laughs> um, any other council comments? Okay. All those, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, motion passes 6 0. Thanks, council. Okay, so now we're moving on to new business item two, which was one, and I think we'll be back on track here. <laughs> So this is our public hearing on general fund 2023 budget revenue sources. And this report comes to us from our finance director, Dave Rodenbach. Thank you, Mayor. Members of council, good evening. This is the public hearing on the 2023 general fund revenue sources. We're required to do this public hearing prior to levying the property taxes, which will be in the next reading. So for 2023, we're looking at property taxes of about 3.3 million, and this will make up about 19% of total revenues for general fund for 2023. The other major categories of revenues are sales tax, 50, about 51%, and other taxes, this would be your B&O for uh, electric, for water, and whatnot. Uh, these are about 2.3 million. Uh, licenses and permits, about 2 million, and this is uh, franchise fees, and this is uh, business licenses. And the four categories I just mentioned are 83% of the general fund, and that pretty much drives our, our revenue structure for the general fund. Uh, with that, I'll just mention the changes that we're looking at in the available revenues for the general fund. So we have a total change in resources. We've gone down 2.6 million from last year. And the reason being is we're, projecting a change in fund balance. Uh, we started the year with a 7.5 million almost fund balance, and we're planning on ending the year at about a 6.3. And that was a planned spend down. We planned to spend a lot more of that this year, but we just didn't. And then uh, intergovernmental revenues went down about 1.5 million, and that's the ARPA funds. We got that for two years, 21 and 22, and we won't have them for next year. So with that being said, uh, I'll just let you go to the public hearing and I'll take any questions anyone may have. Okay, great. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> any clarifying questions from council? I see your light on council member Barber. Was that okay? No, we're, it's all good. Um, I don't see any lights. So I will open up the public hearing on this um, agenda item. Were there any written comments received, Josh? Uh, no written comments for this item. Okay. Um, anyone in the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? Okay. Um, anyone in our online audience wish to speak? And again, you can push star nine on your phone or the raised hand button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, no raised hands online. Okay. All right. We will close the public hearing. And there is no um, action on this at this time. So thanks, Dave, so much for being here and for your great report. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to new business item three. This is resolution 1260, certifying the 2023 
regular ad valorem tax levy upon real property and resolution 1261, levying excess property taxes in the amount of 310,000 for the city of Gig Harbor for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2023. And uh, suggested motion is to move to approve resolution 1260 and 1261. And again, this report comes to us from our finance director, Dave Rodenbach. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. These are two resolutions that we need passed separately. One is for the regular property taxes, and the second one is for the excess. The excess property taxes pay the debt on the Ed and Boat bonds. And I'm happy to say this is the last year we're going to be levying these taxes because we should have enough to pay the 24 taxes at the end of next year once we get this levy. So that's one that will go away. And the excess levy, I'm, I know I'm going backwards in these two, but the excess levy is about seven cents per thousand dollars of assessed valuation. The regular levy is projected to be about 70 cents per thousand dollars of assessed valuation. And the total increase in this year's levy over last year is about 113,000. The so-called 1% increase that we're limited to for the city amounts to $28,000. The rest, the bulk of our increase over last year is due to new construction. Okay. And so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, any questions for Dave on this? Okay, I don't see any lights. Um, so I'll open up the public comment on this agenda item. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak tonight on this agenda item? Okay, um, Josh, were there any written comments received? Uh, no written comments on this one. Okay, and for our online audience, again, you can press star nine on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I see no raised hands online. Okay, we'll close public comment and I will open it up for council deliberation and action. Councilmember member Wook. Thank you. It's nice to get this Ed and Boat paid off, isn't it? What a wonderful thing this has been for our community. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I move to approve resolution 1260 and resolution 1261. Second. Uh, Mayor, I, I apologize. I know the council bill says to that we can do both of the resolutions together. We would like to do them separate. We need two, separate, two motions. separate motions. Okay, Thank sure. You. Thank you. All right, so I move to approve resolution 1260. Was that you, Councilmember Storset? That Second. Okay. Yeah, so one of the times. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Or did you have a question? No? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. And then Councilmember Wook, did you want? And I'll be happy to move uh, to approve resolution 1261. I'll second that again. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much, Council. Okay. So moving right along to item number four, we will um, open the public hearing and have our first reading of ordinance 1502, adopting the 2023-2024 biennial budget. And um, this also report also comes from Dave Rodenbach. Thank you again, Dave. You're the man of the hour, it seems. I'm not used to this. <laughs> I'm usually just a wallflower back here. Uh, okay. 20 324 budget, uh, it's $178,616,968. This is across all funds, general fund on through all the uh, special revenue funds we have and on through the utilities, water, sewer, storm. We're looking at a 28.3 million increase from last year in uh, capital projects. And I, I tried, I, without getting into details, I through this little chart in the, in the memo. So you could see we had some years where we didn't do quite as much. And the 23 portion of this budget is kind of a catch up year because it, it's a down year, if you will, in terms of our estimating. We're, we're looking at potential re recession. Uh, if a recession were to hit in 2023, we probably would not look at the impacts until 2024, 25 here. So what we did was we budgeted 23 flat in terms of revenues. And that combined with the large fund balances we're coming into that cycle with, we're able to do a big spend like we're looking at. 2024, we're looking a, a little bit of a modest increase of 2%. 
now certainly next year when we do the mid biennial review, if that is not the case, we're going to certainly alter course and, and, and change how we're doing some of this stuff. And this would go with the capital projects. And then the other big change from prior is we're adding nine new full-time positions. And, and certainly what we won't be able to start January 1st with nine positions. It's going to be really hard to hire all those and get them on board. And that would be something we would also revisit in the mid biennial review, you know, whether we can afford it, how are things going? And in addition to that, we're going to really closely monitor monthly from here on out. And, and, and just as we've been doing all year, just to see where we're going. And if we see any trends, we probably would not wait till the mid biennial review. We would bring it up at a meeting and, and strategize. So with that being said, I'll take any questions that you may have from my, my memo or anything on the budget. I'm happy to answer. And actually, Dave, before we do that, I would um, like Director Langhelm to give a brief update on the sports complex. We've had a lot of comments from uh, the public and, and some confusion, I think, about the sports complex and what is in the budget and what isn't and why. And so um, I've asked Director Langholm to just give us a, a brief overview of that for the public's benefit and also for um, council as well. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as Mayor said, uh, over the past few weeks, there's been a lot of public comment uh, and discussion related to the sports complex as it impacts or could impact the 23-24 budget. Um, I wanted to just take this opportunity to overview what the budget process is and how we have funded parks projects uh, and how currently in this budget and how they, that could change in the future. Uh, first, the six year capital improvement program that's on page 99 of the budget. I'm going to share my screen. That's why I have my electronics up here so that everybody can see this. There we go. So this is the six-year capital improvement program list that is uh, provided on page 99 of the draft preliminary budget book. Um, the budget adoption process only adopts those objectives that are in the 2023-2024 columns. Uh, the funding of future years for projects is often adjusted through the next budget cycle, so that as things morph, as they change, uh, council gets to reconsider, and that's either through mid biennium budget amend, uh, adjustment or through just a completely new budget process. Secondly, the city routinely funds multiple park projects, and um, we fund other projects that within the park's budget, and they're not mutually exclusive we can fund more than one or two projects. And as you can see in 23, 24, we fund quite a few projects. Uh, these projects uh, are focused on many uh, different parts of our community and not just one group. Um, we have many users in our parks and therefore we need to, and I think the city successfully does, support those many users. Um, and that's, again, as you see in, in the budget. Um, some of those users, uh, just looking at the list, uh, it's Sports Complex, it's Walkers for Cushman Trail, it's the Master Plan for Crescent Creek Park, Scansy Net Shed, uh, another Cushman Trail study, uh, and then um, the Commercial Fishing Home Port. Um, those, all of those projects uh, are here to be able to, to uh, provide support for the many users. Um, back to the public discussion that's been going on. Uh, the city is not proposing to fund transient mortgage. It, in some of the posts that I've seen, it's called luxury yacht mortgage. Uh, the city is proposing for the Ansage home port uh, to have mortgage for commercial fishing operators only. There is no agreement that supports the creation of transient mortgage at Ansage Park. Um, the, while the home port is located at a city park, it's located at Ansage Park, um, it's truly not a park project. It's just put into parks because that's where it's located. This is a city facility, could be as easily put under city buildings um, because it's not intended to uh, 
provide amenities necessarily for the general public. It's intended to provide amenities to a very specific user, commercial fishing operators. Um, but we put it into parks because it's located at Ansage Park. And the funding that is provided in the budget for Ansage uh, home port um, is not limiting the construction of the sports complex that we've been talking about. Uh, even if the home port was not funded, um, those funds, we, you wouldn't take all those funds and just turn them in, and provide them somewhere else to uh, other parts of the budget because some of those funds are, we're gonna be requesting funds from the Port of Tacoma, commercial fishing operators have proposed funding. There's various REIT funding in there along with a little bit of our hospital benefit zone. So it's not like you take everything that was going to the home port and turn it and provide it to uh, someplace else in our park system. Uh, lastly, I, I, I'm sure all of you have uh, read the quick facts. I'm gonna stop sharing and split my screen to something else uh, that uh, our tourism and communications uh, director provided a bit ago. Um, but I just want to quickly overview those facts that, uh, and just highlight a couple of key points. I'm going to put them up on the screen, so hopefully it's big enough for the public and people listening in can see. Yeah, it's a little small. Apologize for that. Um, this was these quick facts were put out a, a couple a few weeks ago. I uh, just want to remind some key facts about the sports complex itself. Uh, the city has already committed to over 10.5 million dollars for uh, the sports complex. Uh, this is including the phase 1A work, the phase 1B work, the phase two work, and the phase three work. Um, we are we funded the whole entire purchase of the phase one property. Uh, that was about $3.5 million. Uh, also the phase two property purchase and the multiple iterations that we went through uh, for the master planning process for the entire sports complex. Uh, we've also recently uh, undergone uh, a co the contract with BCRA for the phase 1B sports complex design and permitting. Uh, that has been a very hefty lift and uh, we anticipate we'll be constructing phase 1B starting sometime next year. But more importantly, the city has a partner already in to build phase 1A. This is the YMCA. They are our community partner and uh, we while the question isn't necessarily can we fund phase 1A, it's that we're not, we're, we're not going to step on the toes of the YMCA who has already, in, on per the lease that was adopted a, a couple of years ago, uh, just work with them to support them in any way they need to build phase 1A. Uh, we are already helping them with some of the land use items that uh, they will need to go through. We're trying to coordinate that right now. Uh, with our designers and their designers to make sure whatever we do for phase 1B will be able to be used for their phase 1A. Um, and so we're, we're able to make that happen based on the funding that we're providing. Uh, in the future and based on the outcome of the phase two sports complex feasibility study, I anticipate that the design and permitting of the phase two site would be included in the city's 23, or sorry, 2526 budget. So, um, but without having a feasibility study complete, we don't have uh, the level of the proposed funding needed. I couldn't tell you today if, if based off of what's going to be provided through a phase two feasibility study, if we're looking at in the uh, six figures or in the seven figures and how far up that scale we could go. So uh, I find it most prudent just to not include that yet, but we, since we're not approving that budget for 25, 26, we'll get that one when we get there. Uh, so um, I think that's all I can say at this point, unless you have any further questions on that. Thank you so much, Jeff. Council, do you have any questions for Jeff? Council member Storset. Yes, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I do, I guess I have a couple of questions. I know we're spending quite a bit of time tonight on the budget. Um, so thanks for giving, obviously, a lot of the back history on this one. We've done this in study sessions, but, um, and I know we've seen a, a lot of concerns coming from our, our public, lots of emails flooding. Um, and so I think that there is definitely more for us to share. I think it's good that we have the open house this week. 
Um, still using my rookie card as a new council member. Um, I have, you know, just <laughs> some questions here as well, but, you know, I start looking at this whole project, you know, sports complex, um, obviously phase one, A and B we're moving forward on. Phase two, I think, you know, people are a little bit weary of just a $60,000 feasibility study without anything else projected out there. Nothing that we have to agree to at this point, but seeing some type of numbers, especially with the amount of capital projects we've taken on, as Dave was just showing us, um, it's kind of like, well, if we want to do these things, where's the money coming from? So I think those are some of the questions we want to get to. I think, you know, when we look at the whole project and I've got a, a printout of it, I've had it up in my office, you know, since running for council of, you know, really caring to see this go through. I think our community is interested in where are we at with phase two and phase three. So I guess these are my comments. It's not really, I'm asking a question, so I apologize, but I do want us to consider what does this look like um, for the next couple of years and getting there. So I don't have any amendments to the budget this time, but I will. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, and I think I think Director Langhelm did a, a great job of explaining why we can't future forecast phone um, numbers without a feasibility study. There just isn't an, a way to predict what it's going to take to convert the current Little League fields into turfed fields. We know there will be new lighting probably that's needed um, as that lighting is pretty old. Um, and then and so that as he said, is, you know, it could come up in 2024, possibly, but probably will be the next budget cycle where we'll be looking at more hard numbers because we'll have that feasibility study back. But I think what, what, what we, what, what council and staff have tried to portray to the public all along is our support for this project and just making sure that the public knows this is going forward. There will also be changes on council. There may be a mayoral change in the next, you know, three years, four years. And so we don't, we can't predict what future councils will do either and what they will decide, but hopefully we can show enough momentum and enough positivity towards this project that the new council members coming on and potentially new mayor coming on would carry that forward and carry this project all the way till, till, till we have six fields there. So, and that's just, that's for the future to decide. We can only do what we can do right now. And so that's what, that's what Dr. Langham has explained is what we can do right now in this budget. So I hope that answers, does, does that, I don't know if that commented to your comment, but <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, we can't make up numbers, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We need that feasibility study to really have some hard numbers on phase two. And then once we have those, we can figure out how to fund it. So any, I don't see any other lights. Anybody else have anything? Okay, Jeff, thank you for that. Appreciate that. And then now any questions for Dave on the budget as a whole? Wow, I'm so impressed with you guys. Okay, I see no lights. That's great. Dave, you did such a good job. <laughs> Um, okay, well, then we will move on to public hearing, opening up the public hearing. Um, were there any written comments received, Josh? Uh, no written comments for the hearing. Okay, um, so anyone from the audience that wishes to speak for this public hearing on this agenda item? Okay, you can come forward, and um, when you come forward, if you would please state your full name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Um, the green light, I think the yellow light will give you your 30 second warning. I think you might need to push the, the button okay. on the mic. There you go. I'm Christine Hewitt, and I live at 4410 Sentinel Court. Um, thanks, Jeff, for that. Um, five years ago, the News Tribune reported on the city of Gig Harbor's need for sports field, and the, the article was titled, the city of Gig Harbor acquires fields in a first step of an ambitious project. The article goes on to say help is on the way regarding the field crisis in our community. Council subsequently approved a master plan that included the design of six synthetic fields 
with lights to be located at the Gig Harbor Sports Complex, as roughly eight months of the year it is dark or inclement weather, and there remains a lack of quality usable fields in our community that is rapidly growing in a population that has more than doubled over the past decade. Uh, keeping in mind with Jeff's facts, the city took the position to support field development in our community, claiming a consistent commitment to the Gig Harbor Sports Complex. Uh, the city wide 2022 post plan, the one year we last year, um, I found it interesting. It deemed the Gig Harbor Sports Complex, uh, as I would say, the most ambitious project, being that it is the largest capital improvement project in the post plan. Uh, the sports complex alone accounted for 25% of all capital improvement park, uh, costs for parks. Um, so not being in government, I have a hard time understanding how um, more money was put towards this project in your budget. Um, and the post plan actually outlines very clearly that the project would be at over 11 million, which is to me not enough. Um, this is far from ambitious. A uh, former council member reported the field situation five years ago as shameful, and I would venture to say that today it is deplorable as zero dollars on the proposed budget for this project. This is far from ambitious, and we have a fairness if we believe that we can take the largest capital improvement project in the past one and complete it without funding. Uh, just so that you can know on behalf of kids, that's why I'm here. Uh, in the United States, kids overall uh, who play team sports have fewer mental health difficulties. Youth involved in team sports are less likely to have anxiety, depression. I think I've ran out of time. Which I'm going to. Yeah, I don't know the mic. Just. We Youth involved in team sports are less likely to have anxiety, depression, withdrawal, social problems, and attention problems in the. Thank you. Does anyone else from the public wish to speak on this agenda item? And uh, again, if you would just state your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, Michael Perot, 4012 Benson Street. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk tonight, and um, I appreciate Jeff's presentation. Um, he, he highlighted what I was going to say is there's a lot, you have a lot in there and a lot of different user groups or interest groups. Um, I appreciate the, the critical habitat that's been preserved or the continued effort to preserve critical habitat in the Donkey Creek drainage, um, the Crescent, uh, Crescent Creek Park, um, the downtown historic waterfront, all sorts of user groups are met there. I, and in your uh, in the phase 1B of the sports complex, uh, pickleball and bocce, ball are, are represented. Um, the one group that isn't represented and which troubles me is the users of synthetic turf fields. And uh, this is important to me because I'm a coach. Um, we had to cancel our practices last week because there's no light and there's nowhere to play. Um, other teams uh, over at Harbor Heights where they're playing a lot of games, they had to cancel those or tr and transfer those games to other fields because the, the fields were in poor condition. Um, I'm going to leave this meeting right after I speak. Unfortunately, I'd like to stay, but I have to go to Tacoma to shuttle kids around because we don't have a place for them to play here in Gig Harbor and they have to go to Tacoma to play. Um, this Gig Harbor sports complex, far and away the biggest goal, and as the mayor knows, was turf lit fields. It is a turf lit field com complex with other assorted amenities. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that a single dollar is being allocated to construct fields. Uh, the YMCA's partnership is amazing and um, we're lucky to have them, but they're raising the money from the community 100%. So um, I don't see any other user groups that are somewhat penalized in the investment of city funds because the community is going to raise $7 million, hopefully, to construct fields 
and they get left behind. That doesn't happen with bocce. It doesn't happen with pickleball. It doesn't happen with commercial home port, even though those commercial fishermen are generously contributing 200,000 I saw. And the six year tip uh, transportation or uh, park improvement plan, whatever it's called, it doesn't have any money allocated to for, for construction of fields. So um, when you think of user groups, don't leave out those kids who use the fields, 7,000 youth participants in our community in field sports alone. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wish to speak? Okay, come forward and please state your uh, full name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, yeah, my name is Richard Lentz. I live at 3940 Sentinel Drive. Um, just want to continue the appeal to devote funds for artificial turf fields. Uh, I've only lived in the area for a year, um, but I've already seen the challenges that my children have had trying to put in sports um, arguments with coaches at the league fields because who's who's practicing today, who's not? Um, I have the field. No, you don't. Um, it, I just see a great shortage of fields that kids need to play. Um, I look around, I see a lot of housing developments that are going up. Developments with, you know, I, I live in one of them. I live in the Harbor Hill area, and more of them are going up. And these are three, four, or five bedroom homes that are being bought and moved into by families, families with kids. Um, there's a lot of people moving to Gig Harbor. It's going to continue to grow. And you got to try and plan and build fields for the incoming kids that are coming here. Um, so, just once again, appealing you to devote funds to build facilities and fields for kids to come and play. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience wish to speak? Okay, please come forward. And please state your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. I'm John DeShane, 7921 70th Street Northwest. Um, I've been on the Gig Harbor Little League Executive Board for the last 17 years. Um, and I can tell you that everything that people are saying here is real. We actually turned away nearly 60 children last year and not allowed them to play in Little League because we had no place to put them. No teams we could practice anywhere. We filled every single one of our fields every day every hour of it, there wasn't any free space. Every school field we could get and every city field and every Penmark field we could get was used and filled. This year, we're already looking at working, going out to Key Peninsula and going to volunteer park to send practices and games out there to volunteer park, because we know we won't be able to accommodate all the children that want to play literally. So this is not something that we're just making up. This is real. We are turning kids away from playing in this community because we don't have a place to put them. This project's been on the books for nearly 10 years, been talked about. And we're still now just doing a feasibility study for the baseball and sports fields and any sports fields that are on synthetic turf. It's just, honestly, I don't understand. It's not shown at all that it's a priority for anybody up here that I'm hearing. To put $60,000 towards a feasibility study and that's all for construction of new fields doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's like you're not hearing what we're seeing or not seeing or not believing what we're telling you. 7,000 children in this community trying to play sports. They can't, there's no place for them to play. We're sending them to Key Peninsula to play now, okay? People are not playing in this community and they're going to Tacoma to play because they know they're going to have trouble. They've seen the trouble they have finding sports fields. It, it's just really happening. It's really sad for me to have been involved with Little League for 17 years and seeing what's going on now that we, we have no place left to put them. We're turning around with almost 900 kids last year in Little League and we had to, we could have had over 900, well over 900 if we could have had a place to let them play. And there wasn't. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak? Okay, um, I think I asked you, Josh, if there were any written comments already. Uh, no written comments. Okay, and then our online audience, um, you can press star nine on your phone or raise hand button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to comment on this item. Uh, no raised hands online. Okay, all right. We will close the public hearing. I wanna thank everybody that came to comment. I wanna thank everybody that sent us emails. We really do hear you and we'll, we'll be talking about this. Um, because this is a first reading, there is no motion to make, but council, do you have any comments? Is there anything that you would like to say to wrap up this agenda item? <laughs> Council Member Storset. Yeah, I just wanna apologize for not following our, uh, our structure because I definitely didn't come out with clarifying questions, more of comments. So <laughs> apologies for that. But um, you know, I was expecting to, hear more of what we've been seeing from our emails. And so um, I definitely think, I want the citizens to know they have a strong voice and if they don't quite 
see something is um, going the way that they think it should, or that there hasn't been enough clarity, even with the work that, that the city is doing and has different expectations, I think it's really important to show up on Wednesday and, and learn and find out more. So thank you. Thanks. Rookie card number one. No. <laughs> Likens. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also thank the people that came tonight um, and just know that we read all of your letters. Sometimes it's a little hard to keep up with responding to them all and staff has been great in supporting us, but we do hear you. Um, you know, and this will be something like says said, we'll be talking about more, um, but please continue to speak up and thank you for caring so much about your kids and community. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights. So um, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jeff, for being here to present tonight. And uh, we'll move on to item five, which is first reading of ordinance 1504, amending the 2022 budget for the park development fund. And again, man of the hour, Dave Rodenbach. <laughs> Bet we're all glad we're not doing budget every night, right? Right. This is budget, budget, <laughs> budget. Uh, this is kind of a housekeeping item. This is an amendment of the 22 budget to account for the property we just purchased. We we purchased property out of the park development fund. And so this is a $4.2 million amendment to, to that budget to, to allow for that purchase. And it's a first reading. We'll, we'll bring this back for a second reading. Okay, great. Any clarifying questions from council on this item? Okay, not seeing any lights or hands. Um, Josh, was there any written public comment? No written comments. Okay. Um, anyone in the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? Okay. Anyone in our online audience wish to speak? Uh, you can push star nine on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. No raised hands online. Okay. We'll close the public comment. And um, if there are no other questions from council, okay, to Councilor Wook. Yes, thank you. I don't really have any questions, but I just wanna thank everybody who has worked so hard to get this done and get this completed in a timely manner. Uh, and uh, our citizens are thrilled. You know, we're saving property, we're saving trees, and, and this is one of their number one things. So uh, uh, congratulations to everybody who is involved and worked so hard to get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I was going to propose a 10 minute break, if that works for everybody, or we can wait and do a couple more. What do you all think? Five minute break. Okay, council says five minute break. I thought the budget was gonna be more intense and it, it wasn't, so that's great. Okay, so five minute break. We'll come back at, I can't tell what time that clock is. 6.53. Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council meeting of Monday, November 14th, 2022. We have returned from our break. The time is 6.55 p.m. And we'll just go straight into item six on our agenda, which is the professional services contract amendment number one with parametrics for Prentice Avenue, Fenimore Street, half width road, roadway improvements. And this uh, report comes to us from our public works director, Jeff Langham. Thank you, Mayor. The proposed amendment number one with uh, parametrics for the Prentice Fenimore project was found to be necessary a little over a month ago. Uh, we were moving through some uh, next steps in our design, and uh, there was two key triggers that we overcame or that we that came to us. Uh, the first was the need for additional right of way, which we didn't anticipate we would need uh, right away when we at the onset. Um, and because we are going through uh, a process that anticipates federal funding, we need to be following the federal process for acquiring right of way, which is uh, more challenging and onerous than if we were to just have local funds involved. Um, and then secondly, uh, throughout many of our capital transportation projects, uh, there are parts of projects here and there that we cannot meet ADA compliance because of steep grades. And if we feel that we can't meet uh, ADA compliance, we have to create what's called 
a maximum extent feasible letter that says that we've done the best we can without completely, you know, ripping up the entire roadway and having to buy massive amounts of property to be able to make switchbacks or what have you. Um, you look at that all around the city, you've got roadways like Stinson and Pioneer and you name it, and the hills are just way too steep to be able to make everything ADA uh, compliant. So originally when we, at the onset of this project, we thought we would need three of those maximum extent feasible MEFs is what we coined them, uh, letters and documents created. Uh, but now we need a total of 11 now that we've gone into design. So uh, that those are uh, pretty extensive processes to take uh, uh, and develop those. So I know this uh, proposed amendment is uh, a lot more than what we would hope, um, but uh, with those two additional requirements, the right of way and the additional maximum extent feasible letters, uh, we are looking to have the uh, proposed contract amendment approved tonight. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Council Member Wick. Thank you, Director Langham. So these letters, do they go towards helping us get federal funding? No, they're a requirement. We have to meet all ADA requirements uh, unless we have an approved letter stating why that we were only able to install something to the maximum extent feasible. And so it's basically the justification and the support for why we can't meet ADA compliance. But what we're required to do uh, these letters, but not to the extent required for federal level. We can do those at staff level often for our own small projects. But when you get into a federal project, there's a there's a lot more involved and we have to rely on a consultant to provide that to us. So this has to be done for federal funding. It, yes, it does. It has to be done for any project, but it has to be done the, through a federal process for the federal for funding. the federal funding. And so so it would help us get the federal funding, do we think? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what, what would happen is let's just say if we didn't do these uh, create these maximum extent feasible letters meeting the federal requirements and uh, and we were actually successful with receiving federal funding, we would have to go back and do it again. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, Council Member Barber. Uh, kind of as a follow-up to Council Member Wook's question. So we had budgeted for, I think you said three, and now we need 11. Is that, I remember when we were walking the, the, um, proposed route, there were different places where you could move the road or move the sidewalk. That is, did the number change from three to 11 because of those design changes that have been made since the original scope? I'm trying to figure out why we went from three to 11. I don't know that answer. If okay. It was because of the actual location of the sidewalk. I can find that out, but I don't know if it was because of that change. Okay. I'm just curious. I don't, we can talk about it offline. Okay. Any other questions for this item for Jeff? Okay, I don't see any other lights. Um, we will open up the public comment for this agenda item. Were there any written comments received? No written comments on this item. Okay, anyone in the audience uh, tonight that wishes to speak on this agenda item? Okay, on our online audience, any hands raised? Uh, no hands raised online. Okay. Close the public comment and I'll open it back up for council deliberation and or action. Councilmember Henderson. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, move to approve and authorize the mayor to execute professional services contract amendment number two. Oops, I'm sorry. Amendment number one to the professional services contract with Parametrix Inc. in the amount not to exceed $131,685.21. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, council. Um, okay, moving right along to item seven. And this is our professional services contract amendment number two for Gig Harbor Sports Complex phase 1B. And again, our re uh, report comes from Director Jeff Lingholm. Thank you, Mayor. Sounding like a broken record a little bit here. Um, 
as you saw on the agenda bill, the city has uh, recently been directed by National Park Service to provide Endangered Species Act assessment for the sports complex phase 1B site. Uh, this is due to the fact that the city is, received an award for uh, RCO funding through a grant from, that's uh, we call it the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's a federal grant. It's implemented through the National Park Service. As part of the requirement before we actually enter into an agreement, we need to uh, engage a consultant to perform this Endangered Species Act assessment. And so this contract amendment uh, will provide um, that Endangered Species Act assessment. We did not anticipate the need for this back when we awarded the contract to BCRA in March of 2022. Uh, and as you see, the total expenditure required for this amendment is just under $7,000. That's my report. Thank you, Jeff. Any clarifying questions from council? Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Director Langham. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, ESAs are looking for endangered species or protected species. Is the timeline going to be okay for them to do a full assessment? Uh, is, sometimes if you do it in the winter, you won't see any of the species and you do it in the spring and there's some there. Is this going to maybe throw a wrench into the timeline of the project? The consultant hasn't anticipated that it would take a, a lengthy time to get it complete. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't see any other lights or hands raised, so we will open up the public comment for this agenda item. Uh, were there any written comments received? No written comments for this item. Okay. Anyone in the audience wish to speak on this? Okay. Um, our online audience, you can press star nine on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, no raised hands online. Okay. We'll close the public comment and I'll open it up to... Council deliberation and action. Mm -hmm. Yes, Councilmember Book. I'm sorry, I keep I need to keep remembering to look <laughs> over there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll make some paper balls or something. <laughs> you need a little bell or something. <laughs> I move to approve and authorize the mayor to execute professional services contract amendment number two with BCRA. I'll second it. Okay, great. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, council. And so we will move along to uh, night item number eight, our first reading of ordinance 1503 relating to uh, utility rates for the city's water, wastewater and stormwater utilities. And there will be um, no motion because this is a first reading. And again, this report comes to us from our public works director, Jeff Langhill. Thank you, Mayor. Last one, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, and Dave, you're just the yeah. superstars tonight. Okay, so uh, following up from our study session from November 3rd, uh, the city operates three independent utilities as enterprise funds. That's the stormwater utility, the water utility, and the sewer utility, AKA wastewater utility. Um, the city hasn't adjusted the utility rates for these three utilities since January 1 of 2020. Uh, since then, there's been more than a 13% increase in the consumer price index, and that has significantly impacted uh, the costs for the city to operate, maintain, and uh, construct improvements for these utilities. At this point, staff is proposing a one-time rate increase for all three utilities at 5% for each utility. That would be effective January 1st, 2023. That's outlined in the ordinance to show the different sections of the municipal code that would be affected by that. Um, the intent is to hold off on um, what could be significantly higher rate increases in the future years if we don't uh, implement some level of rate increase now. Uh, and following up from some comments that we heard at the November 3rd study session related to low-income senior citizen rates, uh, we have, as part of this ordinance, Section 2, proposed the ordinance to, ordinance, sorry, to eliminate any utility rate increase for our low-income seniors. 
Um, it essentially lowers the current discount from 50% in that section of code down to 47% of the regular rates. So no net Great. increase. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any clarifying questions from council? Council Member Denson. Yes, Mr. Langham, I know you mentioned this during the study session, but I can't remember now. Could you give us kind of an average increase in somebody's bill um, with this 5% increase? How many dollars would that be? Sorry. No, that was uh, Ashley Emery. He's the guy that's quick with numbers. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. That's helpful. Uh, uh, let's just say, um, well, I don't want to be too far off, but a, a monthly uh, sewer bill, if, if you if you look at that, if, if it's $100, I mean, 5% would be about $5 increase. Thank you very much. Councilmember Wook. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, especially for putting in here about senior and low and low income folks. And uh, I believe during that study session, council member uh, Likens also wondered if we were going to put a notice in the bills that went out to our ratepayers that how they could find out um, or register to be included in the senior uh, low income. Uh, yes, we are planning on doing that uh, upon the adoption of this ordinance. We'll be implementing that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for doing that. Any other questions from council? Okay, great. Um, I will open up the public comment on this agenda item. Were there any written comments received? No written comments. Okay, anyone in the audience wish to speak on this item? Okay, and anyone in our online audience? I see no raised hands. Okay, we'll close the public comment. And uh, given that this is a first reading, any other questions or comments from council before we move on? Okay. Don't see any. Great. All right, moving on to our final item of the evening is another first reading. Um, so no action will be taken of ordinance 1501, adopting the 2022 comprehensive plan amendments. And this report comes from our new community development director, Carl DeSemis. Thank you very much, Mayor. And good evening, Council. Um, I'm very pleased this evening to uh, bring to you the uh, 2022 uh, Comprehensive Plan Amendments. Um, staff's been working very hard on. Uh, if you'll recall, um, back in February, um, Council moved forward uh, four amendments um, for uh, Planning Commission consideration um, and staff uh, input on the staff work program. Uh, those amendments were uh, one uh, to the to chapter 11, the parks, recreation, open space element of our comp plan, um, one to our environment element, chapter five, uh, which would include uh, climate change and sustainability, uh, one to include uh, a stormwater management action plan uh, as an appendix to our stormwater comp plan, and um, another uh, that would be an amendment to a uh, potential amendment to our utilities element and uh, capital facilities element. Uh, the Planning Commission held two study sessions, as I've noted in the um, in the agenda bill, and a public hearing was held on October 20th. Um, we did not receive any comments. Um, the Planning Commission did make a recommendation to approve three of the four uh, uh, comp plan amendments. Um, and the fourth was uh, not recommended to go forward um, based on um, recommendation from staff, actually, um, as we found that um, the amendment to the utility element and uh, capital facilities element um, needed further study. And uh, we're recommending that it uh, be uh, left on the docket and move forward with the 2024 comp plan amendments. Um, to uh, ensure that we're uh, getting a full analysis of what it is we're trying to amend in that case. Um, so tonight we are recommending, uh, we're uh, bringing forward for first reading uh, three of the four amendments, and that would be the, the parks, recreation, open space element, climate change and sustainability, and the stormwater management action plan or SMAP. 
And uh, I would also like to recognize, I believe that uh, Roxanne Robles is also online with us in case there are any, um, any questions about the two that, uh, that she worked on more specifically. Um, and so we're both here and available for any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carl. Welcome, Roxy, glad to have you with us. Um, any clarifying questions from council? None, okay. Oh, one, council member Barber. I just want to express as, I'll play my rookie card. We're all playing him tonight. I want to express my um, thanks to the planning department for the amazing explanations that they have given to all of us for these projects. It really helps when you have not been involved in planning before to have the background that we were given in very clear and concise detail. So I appreciate that. Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, my uh, thanks to planning and, and Roxy as well. Um, appreciate a great deal putting climate change back into our comprehensive plan. It's high time and I'm looking forward to moving ahead after this gets done and getting some actual action on the ground. So thank you very much and very, very well done. Any other comments or? Councilmember Wook? Yeah, thank you. I, I was on the council back in 2018 when climate change was taken out of our comprehensive plan, much to my chagrin. Uh, and so I sat there for four years and uh, it is an absolute honor to have a staff and have a council that uh, appreciates and understands that climate change and sustainability is important for the future of Gig Harbor. So thanks to everybody who worked on this and has pushed it forward. And, and um, thanks to my fellow council members um, for uh, caring about the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now open up the public comment period for this item. Um, Josh, are there any written comments received? Uh, no written comments. Okay, anyone in the audience wish to speak? Okay, anyone in our online audience wish to speak on this item? No raised hands. Okay, we'll close the public comment. And if there are no further questions from council, I don't see any. Okay, thank you so much, Carl, Roxy, your entire department, uh, Robin Bolster Grant as well for all of your work on this. Really, really good work and very thorough. Much appreciated. Um, okay, we will move on to council reports and comments. Anything that council wants to share? We did item number one for, or um, yeah, sorry, that that was the last one, right? Did I get it right? <laughs> okay, good. I thought so. Council member Denson. Yes, just a quick reminder that Chum Fest is this Saturday from 11 to 4, and thanks to Harbor Wild Watch and all who's putting it on, and then all the organizations that are part of it, and that's at the Harbor History Museum, and it's free, and it's like activities for all ages, so it'll be a lot of fun. Great. Councilmember Book? Yes, thank you. Uh, Gig Harbor has an amazing staff, and they're very responsive to our citizens. They are an A number one staff. I'm grateful to these folks every day. Uh, but tonight I have some special thank yous and I want to thank Paul Rice and his inspectors for their responsiveness to a citizen's concern whose house is located next to a remodel and he had some drainage concerns and Paul got to him, Paul Rice got to him right of way. So that was wonderful. I also want to thank uh, Aaron Hulse for his timely response to a citizen regarding traffic safety issues at Uptown Point Fostic area. He handled that really well and, and took care of her questions. Thank you so much. Um, on November the 6th, I had a wonderful opportunity to speak to that little girl's scout team that was here this evening. So uh, thank you, a big thank you to Diane Bertram who gave these little girls a real um, excellent tour of our city hall. Um, that's really quite wonderful. And um, I also want to say a special thank you to Director Langham and Police Chief uh, Kelly Busey for their work uh, on uh, slowing traffic. 
at, uh, at uh, North Harbor View and Vern Hearts, and it's nice to hear those folks send compliments in. So what a wonderful staff we have, thanks to everybody. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other light, so I would like to, I, I echo Councilmember Wook, thank you. We have an amazing staff. Thank you to our city attorney, Daniel Kenny, for being with us tonight and for our chief to serve and protect us during our council meeting. We really appreciate you being here. And uh, thank you to everyone that attended, everyone that gave public comment. And um, our announcement of upcoming meetings is attached to the agenda along with our strategic plan. And so without further ado, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone.